What are some of the little things in photography or in life or in anything creative in general that require a small amount of effort but have an outsized return? You know, tasks that give us two, five, 10 times the amount of return for our time. When it comes to photography specifically, there are four of these things that I've been doing for many, many years now. You know, habits, if you will, that are super easy to do, but have a gigantic effect on developing photography skills quickly. And I wanna share them with you in this video. But before we get into that, if you're interested in learning photography, I have two courses that you can check out to really level yourself up. One of them is a 30 day photography fundamentals course where you can learn all of the basics of photography in just 30 days. And the other one is a Lightroom editing masterclass where you'll learn how to edit your images like a pro. If you like, you can check out these courses below in the description. Okay, the four habits here that will have an outsized effect on your photography that we're going to cover in this video are number one, creating visual triggers. Number two, visualizing compositions. Number three, always bringing a camera with you. And number four, creating emotional distance. Let's start with number one, creating visual triggers. So when you're out in the world and you are, say you're doing street photography or you're taking portraits or you're in a, a vast and beautiful landscape, what do you take a photo of? You know, more specifically, how do you decide what is worthy of taking a photo of? You know, we can make photos out of everything, but not every situation calls for it and not every situation is worth capturing. You know, when we are in the world taking photos, there are things that we're just inherently drawn to, you know, things that we feel compelled to take photos of. And initially, these feelings are subconscious. You know, we take the photos because they're pretty or they make us feel something, but we can't yet define the constituent parts that make up that feeling or that compulsion. They are unconsciously intuitive. And over time, when we start to develop the language of photography, visual language, when we start to discover and understand visual patterns, we begin to have the vocabulary and the understanding to describe what it is that draws us to certain conditions, scenes, or compositions. And with enough reflection, we can start to understand what visual patterns we're drawn to. And over time, we end up either deliberately or subconsciously creating visual triggers based on these patterns. These triggers are cues that we see in the world and they remind us or they compel us to take photos of them. You know, maybe it's because they're aesthetically pleasing or because they have some kind of meaning, but whatever the case may be, we've encountered them before and we know how to deal with them. These visual triggers end up being and forming the basis of your style. You know, for example, I absolutely feel compelled to take photos of hard light. You know, when I see huge contrast between highlight and shadow, my eyes are just drawn in. And even if I don't have a, a camera with me, I always feel compelled to, to look at high contrast and hard light, like staring into a fire almost. And I feel this way about certain colors as well. You know, blues and yellows and whites are my main colors of choice. And whenever I see these colors out in the world, I can't help but stop and take notice. You know, even when I'm editing, I am always thinking about how I can inject some kind of blue or some kind of cooler tone into my images. Negative space is something that I'm hugely drawn to as well. You know, when there are strong subjects that have the power to stand alone, but they're in a setting that is mostly sparse, something in me is, is triggered and compels me to want to take a photo of that. And you know, some people see puddles on the ground and want to take reflection shots. Some people see umbrellas and want to take photos of them. Other people see pastel colors or old couples or overcast lighting, visual triggers. Right Over time, your visual triggers will reveal themselves to you organically with more and more repetition of practicing visual patterns. But you can also consciously train yourself to be on the lookout for these visual triggers such that they become a habit for you when you see them out in the world. Pick one visual pattern at a time and practice only shooting that thing day after day after day. And eventually you'll start to learn where these triggers show up in the world and how often their sightings repeat. 
you can start to develop a, a sixth sense for you know where they will be and this will really start to take your photography to the next level. Okay, if you're enjoying this video so far, I would really appreciate it if you hit that like button for me so that I know it's good enough to make even more free videos just like this one in the future. Okay, number two, visualizing compositions. Visualization is the most powerful ability we have as humans. You know, I often listen to the Huberman Lab podcast and he was recently talking about mental training and visualization. While real life practice and experience will always be the leading generator of skill acquisition, Huberman says that when real life practice is partnered with mental training and visualization, the results are always greater than just real life practice alone. And I've definitely found this to be the case whenever I'm trying to learn a new skill as well. And as it pertains to upskilling in photography, we have this powerful ability to be able to play visuals of scenes in our mind's eye. You know, we're able to imagine and put ourselves into conditions where we can compose images and imagine how our shot might turn out ahead of time. And I typically do this in two different ways. Now, the first is that when I'm doing research on a location that I've yet to visit, I always do as much visual research as possible. And usually that's via image search via Google just to get a feel of the vibe or it's Instagram to see if other people have been there before. But above all, I always use Google Earth and Google Maps for landscapes, for example, so that I can examine the terrain beforehand. And with all of this information in mind, I can imagine how the scene is going to be like even before I arrive. And I always come up with several compositions and approaches on how I can capture that scene the best, both in the way that you know everyone else might have done it for sure, but more importantly on how I can take that standard composition and then tweak it or approach it in a different way or at a different time or in a different condition so that it's unique to me and to my style. Now, the second way comes back to visualization in the real world and less so in your imagination, but more so in how you spot and take mental notes of your triggers and such as you're going around in your day to day. You know, for example, I am really into the visual pattern of frames. And once you see the world in frames, you can never really unsee it. And I see frames everywhere. And then when I'm going out to, let's say, get groceries or something like that, my mind is constantly spotting different visual patterns wherever I go. You know, I'll see a frame here, I'll see some leading lines over here, I'll notice the expressions on someone's face or how much that person's shirt pops out from the background. You know, optimizing your non-shooting time with composition practice in your mind through visualization means that you just simply have more time getting better at it than the people who don't do this and just get into photography mode when they have a camera in hand. You know, if you always get into the habit of being in photography mode all the time, thinking about these compositions, visualizing them in your mind's eye and finding what speaks to you and discovering moments, then you're just gonna simply have more experience than the next photographer to you. It's as simple as that. And that leads me to number three, which is always bringing a camera with you. And this might sound like a duh point, but hear me out because it's a piece of advice that is just as relevant to beginners as it is to pro level photographers who have been doing it for many, many years. And especially so for the latter, I, I think anyway, as it relates to me. Now for beginners, it's pretty straightforward. You know, bring a camera with you so that you can take photos all of the time so that you're constantly in photography mode and you're consistently practicing. But for the pros, for the ones who have a lot of experience, you know, as you get really comfortable with your photography, as you find your style and your aesthetic and you know what you like to shoot and you know when it's going to appear and you've discovered all of your favorite spots and you've traveled to all the places around the world, you can start to get a little bit jaded with your photography. You know, when you've taken hundreds of thousands or millions of images, sometimes you just feel like not even bringing out your camera anymore because the expectation is that you're not gonna photograph anything usable anyway. And in your experience, you know this to be the case. But that's the problem. You know, being 
jaded and having a certain expectation of the experience means that you miss out on moments and memories for sure. But you also miss out more crucially on the practice of photography as well. And sure, one could argue that on the experienced end, you've already gone through enough practice anyway, but I think adopting a attitude of being an eternal student is such an easy and beneficial way of ensuring that you remain sharp and relevant as an experienced photographer. You know, in the mundane moments, it's easy to practice trying to make something nice out of nothing. You know, it's a good opportunity to make your brain sweat just a little bit and, you know, push your creativity in a direction that you haven't done previously. And it's this constant progression of your craft that tends to slow down the more and more experienced you get. But as an example, you know, when you play RPG games, right, and you're trying to level up, you get experience for killing monsters, but you always get more experience for killing bosses, right? But actually, on the aggregate, you'll always get way more experience throughout the game killing lots of little monsters than the big experience boost of killing the single boss at the end. You know, photography and capturing little moments versus capturing big moments in life is exactly like that. You know, there are way more little moments and that's where the bulk of the experience lies, even though the bigger moments will seem flashier. All right, the last habit here for this video is something that I talked about in my free weekly newsletter, Creative in Process, a couple of months ago, and that is number four, the idea of creating emotional space. And the idea is this, when you take a photo, especially if it's something that you've been desiring to take for a very, very long time, or you know, spontaneous events have led you to the perfect conditions, or there's just a lot of emotional charge to that photo, that photo has bias. And it may be worth pointing out that this bias may or may not be clouding your judgment as to whether or not the photo that you've taken is objectively good, or it's only good because of the merit of your emotion, right? Or on the other side of the fence, you know, perhaps you may think it's bad because of that emotion or not as well. Either way, the more emotionally charged a particular capture might be, the more chance we have of misconstruing the objective success of that photo. And I've seen this happen countless amounts of times in other photographers, and it's happened to me so many times as well. You know, sometimes when I go out to take photos, I might get super duper lucky with the conditions, right? Maybe there's a, a fantastic burst of color in the sky for a sunset, or maybe it's you know a rare weather event or, or something like that. And maybe I'm out with friends and we're having a good time and I make this capture and I think it's the best thing since sliced bread and I'm super, super stoked about it. And while that's all well and good and you should definitely feel good about your captures, if the goal is to produce objectively good images, then hanging on to a lot of that emotional attachment may accidentally artificially inflate the quality of that image by conflating it with emotions. Instead, what we can do is a technique that I've learned from street photographers way back when I first started street, which is that we can delay our development of those images for a later time when we're not so emotionally charged. We can put time and distance between ourselves and the photo. And really, it's as simple as just not looking at your photos after you've taken them for at least a day or two, right? You know, film photographers know this story very well. So when you get back from your shoot, you know, don't load those images into Lightroom or whatever, just leave them in your camera and then wait for a day or so. Then when you come back after one or two days, you know, a lot of the emotional charge that you had for the moment will be gone. And you'll be able to approach those images with a lot more clarity and level-headedness and objectivity. And zooming out for a second, you know, what will happen is that inevitably year over year, over our entire library of images, as our emotions to those images become less and less poignant, there's a natural process that occurs. You know, images that we had once loved, we either no longer feel so strongly about, or they remain in our portfolios as the work that defines us, because they're both 
objectively good and we have a strong connection with them. And this is how portfolio images should be, in my opinion. They should be filtered and washed by time. So as a habit, when you go and take your images, get excited about them for sure, but also give them the emotional space they deserve by only reviewing them after some time has actually passed. And doing so will allow you to see the ones that will stick with you for a lifetime. Okay, creating visual triggers, visualizing compositions, always bringing a camera with you and creating emotional distance. Four habits that have and continue to transform my photography for the better. And if you are looking for even more ways to transform your photography, then watch this video on even more habits to continue doing so. All right, I'll see you in the next video, but until then get out there and make something that matters. Peace.